Right. As the presiding officer has already intimated, the next item of business is stage three proceedings on the prisoner's control of release. Scotland Bill in dealing with the amendments. Members should have the bill as amended at stage two, the marshal list and the groupings. Division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon and the period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I have called the group and members should now refer to the marshal list of amendment and we will start with group one unexpectedly and call amendment one in the name of Elaine Murray in a group on its own. Dr Murray, to move and speak to the amendment, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. This amendment differs from the one that I lodged at Stage 2, where I propose that long-term -term offenders should be required to serve one-eighth of their sentence under supervision in the community, rather than the six months proposed by the Government, irrespective of the length of sentence or the severity of the crime. The Government rejected this amendment, the Covenant Secretary and others arguing that they did not agree with an offender who had spent twice as long in prison should also be supervised in the community for twice as long. The Committee heard evidence from two expert academics, uh, Professor Fergus McNeill and Professor Cyrus Tata at the end of May, which was very critical of the go Government's blanket six months period of supervision. Professor McNeill advised, quote, if you have spent 10 years in prison, six months is a very short period, not least because of the accumulated effect of it, the institutionalization that a long sentence brings, and that, quote, a proportionate system makes more sense. Professor Tata stated, quote, without doubt, it would be sensible to define the period as a percentage of the sentence. And we recently, uh, very recently, have had a briefing signed by several organisations uh, and individuals just, just came out on, sa on Saturday, uh, which, in which they say uh, proponents of the bill have failed to explain how moving from a compulsory supervision period that is proportionate to the length of the original sentence to a blanket six-month period for all long-term prisoners, regardless of sentence or length, better serves the interests of public safety. My stage three amendment, therefore, is to an extent a compromise, but I consider that it has some advantages. It would have the effect of enabling the court to decide at the time of sentencing whether the six months supervision in the community would be sufficient or whether a longer supervisory sentence would be more appropriate if, by the end of the custodial part of the sentence, the offender had been deemed by the parole board not to be suitable for early release on parole. The court could, for example, t take into account the nature of the offence, the length of the custodial sentence and the offender's previous offending history when de determining whether the supervisory sentence should be longer than six months. The maximum length of supervisory sentence would be set at one-eighth of the total custodial sentence. For a sentence of four years, this would be six months, but for a longer sentence, the opportunity would be available to the court to impose a longer period of supervisory sentence. I consider that this would address the concerns expressed at stage two when I propose a supervisory sentence as one-eighth of the total sentence. It allows a proportional approach at the same time when the, the court deems it appropriate. It would also have the added advantage that the custodial and supervisory parts of the sentence would have to be defined at the time of sentencing, thereby improving clarity for victims, the community and the offender. This amendment is intended to be a helpful and constructive amendment, which I believe will improve the bill, and I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will be minded to accept it. Thank you. Many thanks. Now Colin Roderick Campbell. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I accept that the Member's Amendment is in slightly different terms to the amendment at Stage 2. But at Stage 2, I think when she put forward the figure of 12.5%, uh, she did put forward the suggestion that it wasn't really evidence-based. Um, we're obviously familiar with the, the evidence of Colin McConnell, the Scottish Prison Service, uh, on the importance of the first 6 to 12 weeks, and that uh, period of three months was a period also supported by SACRO. Um, I would accept that there's an absence of empirical evidence about some of these matters, but I would remind the member of the comments of Professor McNeill on the 24th of February when he said he wasn't aware of any credible evidence that lengthening sentences in and of itself guarantees the more effective risk management that the bill seems to be trying to bring about. But he was not able to put it more forcefully than that because for obvious reasons of justice it's very difficult to do the kind of research that would experimentally test different re release arrangements. We re do not really get to do that kind of exper experiment in criminology for very good reasons. So there we have it. There is perhaps an, a, an absence of evidence, but I'm convinced that six months gets the right balance. 
Uh, and if we want to give power to the court, as proposed by the amendment, then in my view, we're taking away some of the power of the parole board that they will get from this legislation, which they don't currently have, and increase power um, to decide when someone's fit for release. If we're concerned about future supervision at the time of sentence, then I would expect courts to make better use of extended sentences than they do at the present time. So for all these reasons, I would uh, oppose this amendment. Many thanks. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, one of the key issues debated through the scrutiny of uh, this bill has been the supervision of long-term prisoners once they leave custody. The Justice Committee recommended as part of their Stage 1 report that the issue of some prisoners potentially leaving custody without supervision should be addressed. Uh, that is why the Scottish Government listened to these concerns and introduced into the bill a Stage 2 mandatory minimum licence condition supervision of at least six months for every long-term prisoner leaving custody. Now, the principle of ensuring mandatory supervision at the end of a sentence was welcomed by the Justice Committee, uh, but there was some debate about the, uh, what that minimum length of supervision should be. Elaine Murray, uh, as Amendment 1, would retain the six months as the minimum period of supervision, but give new discretion to the court to decide at the point of sentence to increase this minimum supervision to anything up to 12.5% of a prisoner's sentence. It may be helpful if I explain the effect of Amendment 1 through an example. A person receiving a 12-year sentence with no extended sentence, under the bill, as it is, they will be released if they are still in custody after 11 years and 6 months. Under Amendment 1, the court would be able to decide at the point of sentence to order the release from any point after 10 years and six months into the sentence. Now, the Scottish Government does not support Amendment 1 for two reasons. Firstly, this is because we consider that the length of the mandatory su supervision period should be six months. MSPs will be aware that a considerable amount of work goes on inside prison to plan for the release of long-term prisoners, including a comprehensive home background report is prepared for each long-term prisoner. This includes criminal justice social work being directly involved inside the prison to consider needs as a long-term prisoner becomes eligible for consideration for release. This work looks to ensure that the prisoner is ready as they can be for release, including considering issues such as housing, welfare, and work needs, uh, given that these are key issues about in, in order to be addressed in order to achieve successful reintegration into the community. Keeping this in mind, we think the minimum period of supervision necessary for a prisoner having served close to four years as compared to a prisoner leaving after, say, eight years in custody are likely to be similar, given that both are long periods of time to be incarcerated and additional preparatory work is done while the individual is in prison. The stage one evidence uh, where it, it highlighted uh, a number of different issues, and they highlighted in particular that the initial six weeks to 12 weeks following release are generally the most critical for an individual prisoner once released. It is during these first weeks and months after leaving custody that prisoners have to re-establish themselves into the community and this is when challenges around housing and getting a job are at their most acute. The Scottish Government considers that a period of six months strikes the appropriate balance, therefore. In addition to considering as a, a matter of principle that the six months is an appropriate amount of mandatory supervision period, we think such a role for the court would also usurp the role of the parole board, as it is important to stress that the parole board is there to assess the risk during a prisoner's sentence to decide whether early release is appropriate. The Pro Board can, of course, consider how the, pr the prisoner has been rehabilitated during their sentence, which is not something that the court can do at the point of sentence. Currently, the system will continue to operate uh, so that the Pro Board will be assessing whether supervised early release is appropriate for any given long-term prisoner from the halfway point of their sentence onwards. In our view, therefore, Amendment 1 would undermine the role of our parole board. Therefore, President Officer, we do not support Amendment 1 and would ask members not to vote in favour of it. Many thanks. Uh, Dr Murray, to wind up and press to withdraw your amendment, please. Right. 
Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can just to uh, answer some of the points that were made there. Uh, Roddy uh, uh, Campbell says that it's not evidence-based, but in fact there's no empirical evidence for the blanket six-month period. And indeed, the briefing provided by several witnesses who'd actually come to the committee at stage one have stated that six-month supervision is inadequate, is likely to jeopardise public safety, that reintegration of long-term high-risk offenders takes time, and that there is an increased potential with this blanket six months for ECHR challenges. And now, on the 10 years and six months issue, it would be for the court to decide at the time of sentencing the total sentence that would be served. And the, if it was considered that the person, if they were not uh, reintegrated or if they still presented a great deal of risk at the end of their sentence, that, that that sentence should be 11 years and six months in prison, they could still impose 11 years, six months in prison, plus a supervisory sentence at the end of it. The total sentence is both parts of the sentence. The two, two of them add up. On the issue of the parole board, the parole board would still have a role in deciding whether the offender is released at 50% of the total sentence. I don't understand the argument that this undermines the role of the parole board, because the parole board would still decide if somebody was released early. They would have exactly the same role as they have at the moment, and they would have to assess the risk of the offender being released before the end of their custodial sentence. And I therefore move my amendment. Um, so the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. This will be a five-minute division. And I suspend Parliament now for five minutes.
If we are not agreed, please vote now. This will be a 30-second division. The result of the vote on amendment number one is yes, 30, no, 69. There were 14 abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. Now move to group two. And I'll call amendment two in the name of Margaret Mitchell in a group on its own. Margaret Mitchell to move and speak to amendment two, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I move Amendment 2, which is in my name, which seeks to delay the commencement of Section 1 until the day after the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2015 receives royal assent. I stress that the amendment does not delay the commencement of Section 2 of the Bill. This was an issue raised at stage two when I initially lodged it as a probing amendment in order to give the opportunity to highlight the issues which were worthy of further debate and scrutiny. I had hoped the Cabinet Secretary would take cognizance and address stakeholder concerns about the proposals and acknowledge the advantages of postponing the commencement of Section 1, for there is good reason for this postponement. A fact confirmed with the analysis published as recently as yesterday by key stakeholders who include those who work at the cutting edge of the criminal justice system and include Apex, Circle, Positive Prisons, Positive Future, Criminal Justice Social Workers and Learned Academics, not to mention equality groups such as Women for Independence. Some of their issues of concern include the inadequate consultation and evidence gathering, the fact that automatic release at the two-thirds point of the sentence has now been replaced by an arbitrary period of six months, and also that as a consequence of the new proposals there is an increased potential for ECHR challenges. These influential stakeholders then conclude that this bill will not end automatic early release, it will not produce, uh, reduce re-offending, and it will not improve public safety in the longer term. Indeed, it is likely to jeopardise both public safety and reintegration. In these circumstances, surely, Minister, the only reasonable course of action would be to postpone the implementation of Section 1 of the Prisoner Control of Release Scotland Bill to allow the full debate and detailed scrutiny which the crucially important, this crucially important issue of automatic early release merits. This would facilitate the criminal justice system to be looked at in the round so that discussion and debate would include looking at short-term sentencing, early release and the associated recidivism rates. This is why I again propose Excuse delaying me. the commencement... Excuse me, could we just calm down a little, please, and allow Margaret Mitchell to be heard? ...delaying the commencement of Section 1 until the Criminal Justice Scotland Act receives royal assent. At Stage 2, the Cabinet Secretary indicated that there are no provisions in the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill relating to early release. But I have received assurances from the Head of Legislation and Delegated, uh, Delegated Powers team that there would indeed be scope to address this in the draft legislation later this year. Ending automatic early release, presiding officer, uh, which is confusing for the public and distressing for victims of crimes, is something we can all agree is important to get absolutely right. And I would urge members today to vote to delay commencement of Section 1 to ensure the best possible outcome following scrutiny of the Criminal Justice Bill. Thank you very much. Now call on Dr Elaine Murray. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Um, 
Margaret Mitchell did introduce this uh, amendment at stage two, and uh, as I stated then, um, I'm not quite certain what it is in the Criminal Justice Bill that has to be has received royal assent before that this can uh, go forward, because its provisions of that bill are not necessarily, although this, these were originally going to be introduced during that bill, the rest of that bill does not particularly affect these provisions. And I also don't know why it has to come into force the very next day either. I would remind the Chamber that in 2007 we passed the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Bill, which first introduced custodial and supervisory sentencing. And that, the Law Society and the others are wrong in saying that this approach has never been taken before because it was eight years ago. But that bill, that, those provisions have never actually come into force because the McLeish Commission stated that we would have to get, basically we'd have to get the uh, prisoner population down before it would be possible to do that. So I would ask for assurances from the, the Cabinet Secretary that if passed, this bill will not be implemented until all the necessary community interventions and services are in place, including indeed the extension of MAPA-type arrangements for violent offenders, which I know are currently under uh, discussion. So we can't support uh, Amendment 2. I think if Margaret Mitchell had said the Community Justice Bill rather than the Criminal Justice Act, I might have had a bit more sympathy for the intention of the amendment. Thank you very much. Now call the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Mass. Uh, Sign officer, as I did when Margaret Mid Mitchell lodged the same amendment at stage two, uh, I've listened carefully to uh, what Margaret Mitchell has said just now, uh, as uh, she said out also at stage two in considering uh, this particular amendment. Um, I must confess I'm some, still somewhat confused uh, by Margaret Mitchell's uh, uh, views on this matter and why she thinks it's important to delay the commencement of these reforms after they have been through the Stage 1, Stage 2 and the Stage 3 process that have been considered by Parliament, and that we should delay the uh, introduction of this bill, the commencement of this bill, uh, pending parliamentary approval of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill, uh, and then uh, royal, once royal assent has been given to that particular piece of legislation. Now, as indicated at stage two, and as Margaret Mitchell has even acknowledged herself in the point that Elaine Murray has also uh, reinforced, is that there are no provisions contained within the Criminal Justice Bill relating to automatic early release. And I can see absolutely no good reason to delay the commencement of this bill in the manner that would result from amendment, uh, uh, to, uh, amendments to being agreed. It is, of course, entirely possible that uh, stage two amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill will be considered by the Justice Committee during uh, the stage two process. Amending this bill, though, to tie it into future legislation, which we don't know even if it will have any provision in it in the first place, because there's no intention of the government to bring forward amendments in these areas, would be, to a large extent, would be to preempt Parliament's consideration of the Criminal Justice Bill. And I do not think that is an appropriate way for us to take forward legislation in this Parliament. Again, President Officer, I have listened very carefully to Margaret Mitchell uh, and what she said to justify her amendment at Stage 2 and as she did at Stage 2. And I have listened again here at Stage 3. I do not believe that there is any good justification for delaying this important reform in this bill uh, concerned with public safety uh, after and when it receives royal assent and why we should tie that to the Criminal uh, Justice Bill. And on that basis, uh, President Officer, uh, we oppose amendment to and have asked Parliament to reject it as well. Thank you very much. I now call on Margaret Mitchell to wind up and press to withdraw your amendment, please. Yeah. Uh, I think to answer Elaine Murray's point, the whole issue of early lease would be discussed in the context of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. And this would allow the time for the proper scrutiny and debate that we simply haven't had. So while the, the Cabinet actually said we've been through stage one, where um, the bill was not fit for purpose and then had to be changed beyond recognition as stage two, um, I, I don't think we can take much comfort from the stage one process. And at stage two, as I say, we had to change it from ending automatic, uh, automatic early lease to merely amending the rules. Now, um, 
in my book, that doesn't really fill you with uh, confidence that we've gone through a process that um, suggests the legislation before us is good legislation, has been properly scrutinised and debated. And the point is, presiding officer, this amendment is a reasonable one, which would ensure that by delaying the commencement of Section 1, the best possible outcome would be achieved following scrutiny of the Criminal Justice Bill. At the very least, it would, pro it would have helped to confirm that the period of mandatory supervised release in the community is sufficient and properly thought through to address the practicalities of housing, benef housing benefits and employment, adequately resourced to ensure the essential criminal justice social work is in place and supported by a level, level of surveillance using all the modern technology available in accordance with the assessment of risk. And it is for these reasons, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, that I press the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And so the question is that amendment to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. This will be a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number two is yes, 14, no, 97, there were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed and that ends consideration of amendments. And so we will now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13597 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Prisoner's Control of Release Scotland Bill. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible and I now call on the Cabinet Secretary Mr Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion Cabinet Secretary you have 10 minutes or thereby a generous 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to open this stage 3 debate on the Prisoner Control of Release Scotland Bill. I want to first of all offer my thanks to the Justice Committee, the clerks to the committee and all of those who gave evidence during the parliamentary scrutiny of the Bill. Before I move on to why the reforms contained in the Bill are important, I think it is appropriate to reflect on how this Parliament has helped to shape and improve the Bill. Through the diligent work of the Justice Committee under the leadership of Christine Graham, its convener, Stakeholders' views have been sought and committee members have carefully reflected on the evidence they have heard in making recommendations to improve the Bill. That is why at Stage 2 the Scottish Government lodged amendments to make this better legislation and that is to the credit of the scrutiny role undertaken by this Parliament and in particular members of the Justice Committee. As members will be aware, the Bill is relatively small in size but contains important reforms in two key areas of prisoner release. Policy on the early release of prisoners is an emotive topic which often generates considerable debate and there has certainly been, that has certainly been the case as this legislation has been scrutinised by Parliament. What Section 1 of the Bill will do is end the current system of automatic early release for all long-term prisoners at the two-thirds point of sentence. In its place will be a system 
where long-term prisoners will no longer be entitled to automatic early release at all, whilst the rest will have early release restricted to only the last six months of their sentence. It's important to explain clearly what this bill will do. Automatic early release is ended for any long-term prisoner with an extended sentence. This means those prisoners that, ha that the court has assessed as having the highest need for supervision will never be released automatically from custody. Such prisoners will always have supervision when they leave custody through the operation of extended sentences. Figures show that about 50% of long-term prisoners receiving sentences for sex offences have an extended sentence in place. About 20% of other long-term prisoners also receive an extended sentence, so a significant number of long-term prisoners will in future never be entitled to automatic early release. In response to the views of the Justice Committee, the bill, has, the bill was improved at stage two to ensure supervision would be in place for each long-term prisoner leaving custody. This avoided the issue of a prisoner being subject to cold release into the community. What this will mean in practice is that a long-term prisoner without an extended sentence will be released with six months left on their sentence. This release will include licence conditions for supervision to help the prisoner to reintegrate into the community and ensure steps can be taken to recall the prisoner into custody if breach of conditions occur. Then, officer, we consider these reforms will help to provide greater public safety. Discretionary early release will still be possible following these reforms, but automatic early release is neither either ended or severely curtailed for long-term prisoners. We think it is right to trust the independent parole board so that they can continue to consider the cases of individual prisoners and make decisions about whether to authorise early release on the basis of an assessment of the risk of that individual and what risk they may pose to public safety. There is data about how the behaviour of those in the community following automatic early release compares with those in the community following discretionary early release. The rate at which prisoners breach their licence conditions following automatic early release is seven times higher than the breach rate for prisoners who receive discretionary early release. The rate at which prisoners are recalled to custody following automatic early release is five times higher than the recall rate for prisoners who receive discretionary early release. The Independent Parole Board do a challenging and difficult job, and if this bill is approved, they will have increased powers to carry on their good work and make more decisions about whether long-term prisoners should be released into the community before a sentence nears its end. This will help keep communities safer while still allowing early release for any individual prisoner to aid their integration into the community where the risks to public safety are manageable in the community. It is worth discussing uh, why I believe uh, the minimum length of supervision should be six months. MSPs will be aware that stakeholders suggested that it is the initial weeks and months following release that are generally the most critical for individual prisoners reintegrating into the community. It is during this period when prisoners leaving custody seek to re-establish themselves into their communities and when challenges such as accessing housing, work opportunities can be at their most acute and where a mandatory control period would be most appropriate. A period of six months will ensure supervision during this important period of time. Now, of course, there is considerable work that goes on inside prison in the lead up to a long-term prisoner being released. And while the length of supervision is important, it is our view that the quality of support and supervision in the lead up to the release and following the release are crucial. 
Presiding officer, reducing reoffending is a priority for this government. While reconviction rates are at a 16-year low and recorded crime is at a 40-year low, we can always do more to help address offending and its underlying causes. We are clearly uh, taking forward work in order to reduce reoffending, uh, and that requires more effective and closer links uh, to be established between the uh, criminal justice system and other wider aspects of our public sector and the third sector in Scotland. So, you know, I chair a Scottish Government ministerial group for offender reintegration, which has sought to address the key demands for better integration between our criminal justice system and wider public services in order to help facilitate a reduction in reoffending. The second area of this bill makes an important contribution in this area and is a key ministerial commitment to that particular group. Prisoners being released from custody when important support may not be available to them in the community is a key barrier to ensuring continuity of support on the transition from custody into the community. The ability of prisoners to be able to access public services such as housing, welfare and addiction services and advice on the day that they are released is crucial to helping to secure the success of their reintegration. This can be particularly problematic though on Fridays and the days preceding public holidays. Where there is evidence that suitable arrangements are required to address a prisoner's reintegration needs and these cannot be addressed immediately upon release, what this bill will do is allow the prisoner's release to be brought forward by up to two days. Now, I welcome Parliament's strong support uh, for this important provision, which will make a real difference in individual cases to allow a more flexible approach to supporting prisoners upon their release from custody. Signing officer, this bill will improve the system of early release by allowing decisions about how and when long-term prisoners are released from custody to be informed by three key factors. Individual consideration of a prisoner's needs, the risk to public safety the prisoner may pose, and the need to also ensure that we have effective supervision in place. This is the best way, I believe, that we can protect our communities and also offer reassurance to the public. And on that basis, President Officer, I move that the Parliament supports the Prisoner Control of Release Scotland Bill. Many thanks. I now call on Dr Elaine Murray. Seven minutes. We are actually now quite tight for time, so a pretty exact seven minutes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The term ending automatic early release has been so, so often used over the years that its meaning hasn't been questioned until the Justice Committee heard the evidence pre presented at stage one. And it certainly made me think again about an aspiration that for years most members of this chamber have held to be desirable. Currently, between half and two-thirds of the total sentence uh, is imposed is served in custody and the remainder is served under licence in the community, during which time the offender is supervised and can be recalled to custody if the conditions of the licence are breached. And whether the point of release is at halfway or at the maximum of two-thirds of sentence is determined by the parole board on the basis of the risk that the offender may pose to the community. So the, fact, the bill that was introduced at stage one proposed that for certain categories of long-term prisoners, those who had been deemed, uh, not been deemed to be safe to be released on parole should serve their entire sentence in custody and then would be released cold into the community without any mandatory uh, supervision. So an offender serving a long-term sentence for a series of violent crime who had not been rehabilitated, re rehabilitated would walk out of prison at the end of their custodial sentence and disappear into the community. Uh, and I was pleased when the, the government therefore indicated that its intention to amend the bill at stage two, uh, and we therefore supported the, the, the bill at stage one because that, the mistake of allowing that sort of release had been recognised by the government. The bill before us this afternoon does not end automatic early release, nor should it indeed, for the reasons that I have just stated. The bill provides that long-term prisoners must serve the last six months of their sentence under licence and supervised in the community, as the Cabinet Secretary described. And although my amendments at stage two and three argued for greater flexibility and proportionality with regard to the period of time served under supervision, 
we do agree with the general approach the government is taking towards sentencing because it very much resembles the approach taken back in 2007 by the Labour Liberal Scottish Executive when we introduced the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Scotland Act, an act which was subsequently amended in 2010 by the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act, namely that a sentence involving imprisonment should consist of two parts, a part to be ser served in custody and a part to be served under mandatory supervision in the community. And as the Cabinet Secretary said at stage two, in in essence, the sentence is a custodial and supervisory one. That was the intention of our legislation uh, in 2007. And we believe, like the government, that a sentence served under licence in the community is not a soft option. It is not a release from sentence. However, I and the academics whose evidence I quoted during the debate on my amendment have argued for a more flexible approach with regard to the length of sentence served under, under super, supervision. The supervisory part of the sentence has to be efficacious and it has to be right for the individual offender. It has to provide the rehabilitation and to, to strive towards the prevention of reoffending. And I consider that this could have provided an opportunity to ensure that clarity at the same time of sentencing, as the court would specify the minimum time to be served on licence when the offender had not been released on parole prior to that point in their sentence. But that, unfortunately, has not been accepted by the government. So, is the bill, as it is now drafted, preferable to the current situation? Will victims, communities and offenders be given a more accurate picture of the maximum custodial sentence for the offender? Yes, I think they will. Will members of the judiciary alter the length of sentences imposed for these sentences? Quite possibly they will. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wish to provide greater flexibility. It won't, however, affect the majority of the prison population. It's still only about 3% of prisoners who will be affected. Is six months an adequate uh, period of time uh, to serve in the community under licence. The Law Society provided a briefing to MSPs last week in which it expressed its reservations, stating that the reduced period, licence periods of six months may be wholly inadequate to assist reintegration into the community and reduce the risk of offending. In the ministerial... No, I, sorry, I, 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 want to do, I haven't really got much time. Uh, in the ministerial statement uh, prior to this uh, debate, Fergus Ewing uh, reminded us that irrational decisions can result in judicial review. And can I just refer to the briefing which we were all provided with on, on Sunday um, from not only four academics, but Apex Scotland, Circle Scotland, the Howard Leeds Scotland, Positive Prisons, Positive Futures, the so Scottish Association of Social Workers, Social Work Scotland and Women for Independence, Justice for Women group, all said the bill seems to us to have been created without careful thought and without informed policy uh, by the extensive national and international evidence on custodial and community sentencing policy. And they say for, the bill misses the opportunity to better clarify sentencing and release policy. It may well be possible to combine the virtues of public safety with clarity in sentencing, but unfortunately this bill appears to achieve neither. We have, during the passage of this bill, taken a constructive approach to the bill. We have supported the government at stage one and at stage two very much in the hope that a proportionate, super, a proportionate supervisory sentencing regime could be achievable. And the government debated my uh, stage two amendment uh, and my stage three amendment was submitted in time for the government to lodge an improved alternative if 12.5% 12, 12 was not appropriate. There was time for the government to come forward with something which was more appropriate, but it did not. It has stuck by this blanket six months supervisory sentence at the end of the sentence. Sorry, I haven't got much time. The, the government has not been able to provide evidence that a six-month supervisory sentence for all long-term prisoners is a proportionate and sufficient. It does not provide evidence that public safety will not be compromised if somebody has not actually uh, engaged uh, appropriately within that six months. And there is also the argument six months, actually, if you didn't... Uh, uh, conform to the conditions of the licence during that six months, they'd only be back inside for a short period before they were back out again. So it wouldn't necessarily be effective for all uh, prisoners. And it also has been argued that there could be increased ECHR uh, implications with the bill as proposed now. And it is for these reasons, and indeed with considerable regret, that I advise the Chamber that Scottish Labour cannot support this bill tonight. 
Thank you. I now call in Margaret Mitchell. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I begin by paying tribute to the Justice Committee clerks for their hard work and also to those witnesses who provide such vital and insightful evidence uh, at stages one and two of the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. The bill is in two halves. Section two provides the Scottish Prison Service with the power to release prisoners up to two days early to facilitate community reintegration. This is a sensible proposal which will create the flexibility required to help to provide access to adequate support services at a critical juncture for the offender. Unfortunately, um, the same cannot be said of Section 1, which deals with the automatic early release of prisoners. In its 2007 and 2011 manifestos, the SNP government made commitments to end automatic early release. Six years later, it brought forward an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill, which pledged to end automatic error release for less than 1% of prisoners. And then it presented the same proposals in separate legislation to end automatic early release for sex offenders receiving custodial sentences for four years or more and other serious offenders receiving sentences of 10 years or more. As numerous witnesses pointed out, there was little logic to these proposals given the low level recidivism rates for these categories of prisoner. So, the new Cabinet Secretary ta tabled amendments at stage two, extending the bill's provisions to all long-term prisoners with a determinate sentence of four years or more. But even with these changes, the legislation now covers just 3% of prisoners. Despite the Cabinet Secretary's efforts at stage two to attempt to justify the bill, witnesses and stakeholders maintain that section one is not fit for purpose. There has been absolutely no attempt to carry out the necessary, necessary meaningful scrutiny and debate about the provisions which have been described by the Law Society of Scotland as possibly the most radical change in custodial sentencing for 22 years. We are now in a situation where the legitimate concerns and criticism, if you don't mind, um, I'm going to make progress, Ms. Dallard. Um, we are now in the situation where the legitimate concerns and criticisms of stakeholders, ranging from learned and respected academics to third sector and voluntary organisations at the cutting edge of the criminal justice system, including criminal justice social workers and the Law Society of Scotland, together with the Howard League and gender and equality groups groups such as Women for Independence and Justice for Women are being swept aside by the new Cabinet Secretary. Stakeholders' deeply worrying comments highlight the many deficiencies within the Bill in terms of the flawed procedure and lack of evidence and the proposed blanket six-month compulsory supervision period and the potential for Article 5 ECHR challenges. The Government's Proposed changes at stage two simply replace automatic release at two-thirds point of the sentence with automatic release at six months before completion of a sentence. Now, if you don't mind that I've got some progress to make. This, in turn, has proportionality implications which may lead to potential HR challenges. The government has not made the case as to why it has rejected a proportionate approach. Professor Fergus McNeill highlighted the extent of this problem when he pointed out that under the current fixed period proposals, if a person is sentenced to five years, 90% of their custodial sentence would be in prison. However, if a person was sentenced to 10 years, that then increases to 95%. Furthermore, at present, demand for rehabilitation program already outstrips supply, and this is almost certainly going to increase, leading to an inevitable challenge under ECHR. 
To quote the somewhat damning indictment of key stakeholders, this bill does not end automatic early release, it does not reduce re-offending, it does not improve public safety in the longer term. Indeed, it is likely to jeopardise both public safety and reintegration. In these circumstances, Deputy Presiding Officer, it would be foolhardy to support this bill. Thank you. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Roger Campbell to be followed by Graham Pearson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think we must acknowledge this bill has moved since stage one, and it operates in the context of both the 2007 and 2010 legislation in this area, as yet to be implemented, and of course the McLeish Commission. But what the bill is not about, and does not purport to be, is a bill about clarity in sentencing. The Sentencing Council in due course will no doubt help in that area and we should wish that new body well. Nor is it the last word on automatic release, as is absolutely clear. But it's clear that this bill represents a first step along the way of ending automatic release and of reversing the Tory policy of 1993. I think we ought to recognise the government's positive response to criticism of what was described as cold release. And we all should also recognise what Dr Barry described in evidence as the need for proactive support in relation to accommodation, employment, education, benefits and so on. And we should also uh, bear in mind the need for through care for offenders returning to the community. We should welcome the commitment by the Scottish Prison Service to 42 such officers. This provides support for offenders in order to reintegrate back into the community, building on the work already commenced in prison, to which the, first, so the Cabinet Secretary has referred earlier. And yes, there is a need to ensure that there are adequate numbers of programmes available to offenders within prison to enable them to change their behaviour. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, they will need to be adequately resourced. But we have time to plan for this. Indeed, as the Cabinet Secretary said at Stage 1 uh, debate, an independent review of prison programmes, including psychological programmes, will be carried out. And I really don't think it's helpful to highlight possible ECHR challenges if programmes are not in place. We need to allow the Scottish Prison Service to get their house in order. The government always recognised that any reduction in the period of automatic release might incentivise participation in programmes, and that planning needs to take account of that. And let's also bear in mind in that context that planning can be complex. Eric Murch of the Scottish Prison Service commented in evidence that some prisoners will deny that they have a problem until very close to their critical date, and then they will try and move up the list. Is six months of guaranteed supervision adequate? Yes, well, we've heard a lot of debate about that. There are a variety of views. We know the Sacro and Colin McConnell position, and we know that others take a different view. We've debated this earlier, so I won't repeat the arguments. But I would point out that the academics themselves accept that the highest risk period is immediately after release, even if they don't accept that this was the only period when support is required. But we reached a decision on that period earlier. I have no doubt that the courts will take account of its provisions and also of alternatives such as the increased use of extended sentences at the appropriate time. Some of the academic critics of this bill would, I believe, if their wishes were granted, simply succeed in kicking matters into the long grass. That's something that even Margaret Mitchell at stage one suggested was a real danger and something that Sarah Crombie of Victim Support said in February would cause them concern. So despite the academics, we do need to grasp the nettle. As to issues of public safety, clearly that remains important. I'm really not sure what the frequently mentioned empirical evidence, if it were ever obtained, would show. Suffice it to say, for this group of prisoners, instead of being sent out to the community, come what may, at the two-thirds mark, that will no longer be the case. The parole board will have a greater role than now. Public safety, in my view, will not be reduced, and let's not forget the availability of extended sentences to courts at the time of sentencing. That provides additional protection for the public in appropriate cases. Presiding officer, concerns have been expressed about the financial costs of this legislation by 2031. To, to that, I would say, that's a long way off, and much can happen, happy, can happen in the interim. But I, will, I hope, encourage further thought to be given as to the appropriateness of many short-term sentences, which frankly, as we know, often do not act as a deterrent and certainly don't provide adequate time for rehabilitation. Presiding officer, I believe this bill, despite its critics, has considerable value and I commend it to the Parliament. Many thanks. I do have a little bit of time in hand at this stage for amendments, not much but a little. Graham Pearson to be followed by Alison McInnes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm pleased to speak in this debate this afternoon, although I am disappointed that I see it as a missed opportunity in introducing legislation in this manner. 
Uh, Roderick Campbell says that this is a positive response from the government to the issue of early release, and he added for this group of prisoners. Uh, but indeed, it's a very exclusive and small group of prisoners. Let's remember how we arrived at the position we're in today. In 2013, Kenny McCaskill, when introducing his bill, he said, we have stated clearly our aim to end the system of automatic early release. We are committed to fulfilling that pledge. In 2014, he added, this government is taking tough action to keep communities safe and reduce the likelihood of prisoners reoffending. I'm sorry to say I don't see the amended uh, bill as reflecting on those commitments. And indeed, uh, I see that Professor Cyrus Tata, in his evidence to the committee, observed that the reconviction rate for those serving uh, sentences between six, uh, three and six months is 53%. And yet, having served only half of their sentences, they will not be subject of supervision by criminal justice social work. So what we should be talking about today is not early release. As Professor Fergus McNeill indicated, it would be much better that we identify a timely period for release eh, rather than early release. And I would reiterate that I don't eh, see that current legislation delivers on the notion of a timely release with the appropriate supervision thereafter. As Dr Monica Barry reflected, the focus uh, the current legislation is very much about offence and time and length of sentence rather than the risk and the threat that uh, is perceived and being delivered in terms of community safety. And for, for that reason, there is a shortcoming in the approach that has, has been delivered in this respect. Indeed, from a, a member of the public's viewpoint, for a victim and a witness, this bill does not cla uh, issue a clarity of sentencing to give them confidence that they know precisely what is to happen with an accused after that person leaves the court upon conviction. And therefore, it doesn't uh, deliver what was suggested, in my view, by victim support in saying it was an important advance which will go a long way to improving public perception of justice in Scotland. The debate today from the Cabinet Secretary and from those in the Chamber indicate how confusing this whole issue still is. And indeed, uh, Professors Tata and Fergus McNeill, along with Dr Barry, suggested from their view that the bill deserves scrapping and we should go back to the start again. And I've got to say, I have some sympathy with that view. Front door sentencing and back door releases are something that the public cannot stand and are extremely frustrated by that prospect. I'm happy to take the intervention. Kishna Lad. I thank the member for taking an intervention at last, uh, because I think it's very important to understand what the academics told the committee. The academics said the problem is called release, and there is a vast amount of cold release which is happening, and the cabinet secretary made sure that there will be no cold release from now on with a mandatory period of six months. It's where your public safety is. It's stopping cold release. Graham Pearson. I'm, I'm grateful for the intervention, and I accept that the days of cold release should be history, but unfortunately it still is not. Uh, I attended at a number of third sector meetings over the last few months where the men concerned in being released from prison still suffered from a cold release with no support. What I would rem remind the Chamber is that those who will be affected by this legislation number in a few hundreds. Those who are sentenced each year are over 14,000. This legislation does not provide an end to early release. It needs to be reassessed and reconsidered. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. I now call Alison McInnes to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this afternoon it's important to remember that automatic early release is a management device. It's a safety valve and it was introduced to ease the pressure caused by escalating prison populations, not because of any compelling evidence that it in itself would improve public safety. So the questions facing members today are, will this reform reduce reoffending? Will offenders receive sufficient supervision and support? Will it better protect our communities? 
And will it make sentencing more transparent and give victims more certainty? Now, the bill faltered because in the initial draft, it was flawed in a number of these respects. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to listen and respond to the Justice Committee's concerns as set out in Stage 1 report. And I suppose the question this afternoon is, has he gone far enough? Members have received a late joint submission and others have re uh, made reference to that from witnesses, including academics, the Howard League Scotland and Positive Prison, Positive Futures. And they've cast doubt on whether he has gone far enough. And I have some sympathy for their argument that the bill has not been entirely substantiated. For example, there's less than comprehensive evidence supporting the flat six-month release. Nevertheless, I think the Cabinet Secretary has today set out in some detail why he considers we should still proceed with the bill as amended. And I'm also mindful that the Risk Management Authority and the Parole Board are broadly supportive of the legislation. It would mean the Parole Board would be involved in decisions about the release of each individual long-term prisoner. The release of potentially dangerous offenders would be delayed and the public would continue to be protected from those who have failed to progress through the prison regime or mediate their behaviour to the extent that they could be managed in the community early. It would mean the parole board decide when each long-term prisoner is fit for release based on individual circumstances and delaying the release of dangerous offenders, those who haven't mediated their behaviour or engaged with rehabilitation programmes. I believe the reforms could also cause more prisoners to engage at an earlier stage in their sentence. We're talking about those whom the parole board described to us as happy to wait in the knowledge that they will get out after two-thirds of their sentence, irrespectively. However, when it comes to providing programmes and courses, ministers and the Scottish Prison Service will, of course, need to ensure that supply meets demand. And there is no doubt that the government must ensure that the quality of the proposed supervision of long-term prisoners on the six-month release is adequately resourced and regularly reviewed. Turning to section two of the bill, it's eminently sensible to release some people a day or so early if it guarantees they receive the assistance that they desperately need with accommodation, employment or addiction. Many public and third sector services don't operate 24-7 or they aren't easily accessible, particularly in rural and remote areas of Scotland. But, President Officer, this short bill is a reminder of the Scottish Government's record of disjointed penal reform. It reforms early release for some prisoners in isolation and neglects many more pressing priorities. Why haven't successes in reducing youth offending been rolled out more widely yet? Where is the concerted shift towards diversion from prosecution or effective community-based sentences? And where are the plans to further reduce senseless, destructive, short-term sentences or to re reduce the numbers on remand? In 2013 14, 4, 000, just over 4,000 people were handed sentences of less than three months, despite us uh, having a presumption against three month sentences in 2010. A further 5,000 were imprisoned for between three and six months. Now, these are people whom the McLeish Commission dubbed more troubling than dangerous. And yet they take up the time and effort of the prison service, limiting the ability of the SPS to engage with the most serious long term offenders. And of course, it's perverse that those young people and short-term offenders are most at risk of reoffending still don't benefit from statutory through care. I therefore urge the Justice Secretary to develop a clear, overarching, generally progressive strategy that's bold and ambitious. And we need to focus on how to bring an end to the primitive, punitive approach that causes so many people to be sent to prison in the first place you must when it clearly it isn't the best place for them or the communities that they return to. Many thanks. John Finney to be followed by Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The, the policy memorandum talks about uh, helping reduce offending and improving public safety, and, um, and it's important that we have an evidence base for that. People have alluded to the Justice Committee's report, which questioned the focus on sex offenders, not least given their compliance whilst in custody and the level of re-offending, and we heard clear evidence on the Risk Management Authority on that. So, um, well, so there was discussion also at the Justice Committee on the populism of this uh, particular um, proposal. Um, I don't think in any way that it's weak for the Cabinet Secretary to have changed the, his position on a number of issues. I think it's actually strength to have listened. After all, that's what the Parliament's here for. It is that scrutiny and the change that's important. So I think that's a, 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 I think time will tell if reducing offending um, is a, a consequence of this. To my mind, it's poverty prevention and poverty alleviation would be uh, 
but everything will play its part. And what we do know is there's a clear link between supervision and support and reducing offending. And these critical early days have been talked about. Lesser talked about is there being the provision that brings forward the release date um, to a assist prisoners to reintegrate, we're told. Well, of course, I would question if any of them, have, some of them have been integrated in the first place. That's where the challenge lies. There's challenges around housing, health, and increasingly DWP. Now, we, we can deal with the, the first couple. We can't deal with uh, the third one, but uh, clearly we would want some uh, alignment with UK policy there. The proportionality of supervision, and I had discussions with Dr Murray in advance of that, and I was minded initially, as Dr Murray knows, to lend my support to our proposal. What changed my mind in that was discussions that I had with the Cabinet Secretary at stage two, where I sought uh, confirmation and what, what this would mean for individuals. We know that there, there's community justice social workers working in our prisons, uh, and they do an admirable do job. I ask about a risk assessment for the individual, uh, and I also say that treating everyone equally doesn't mean we treat them the same. People have different needs. And I was reassured with what I heard there, and that's why I will lend my support to this legislation tonight, reassured that the non-statutory support there that continues uh, uh, after six months, and the plans for release that are very important involving the Scottish Prison Service and the, the, the Criminal Justice Service. And a very key phrase in what that persuasion was when the Cabinet Secretary said that it was quality rather than quantity, indeed one member has already raised that, that was important. And, uh, and I think he's linked with the chairing the Ministerial Group on uh, offender reintegration is important. Uh, and, you know, long-term prisoners, I commend the approach that has also been mentioned about uh, release to help uh, start employment. Through care officers, 27 of them, that's very important. I'm keen to see progress on that. The Christie Commission talked about uh, uh, organisations working together with the integration of health and social care, but there still are challenges, as, as members have said, for prisoners who have been released. Um, the availability of rehabilitation programmes I don't think should be skirted over. Uh, the Scottish Human Rights Commission said that there was a possibility of prisoners raising appeals regarding that, and that would ultimately affect the, the right to liberty under Article 5 of the ECHR. Um, so I think that is important. I think also the balance, the cost, and something I mentioned previously, over £16 million for this, compared with a uh, community justice uh, um, budget of £31.8 million. And I would ask, is the balance correct in the scheme of things for that? And where it fits in the overall direction of travel? Um, I would like to see a situation where the only people who are being confined are people who pose a threat to our communities. Um, um, and Dr Murray talked about MAPA being extended to cover violent offenders. That's something where there would be, again, an evidence base for understanding um, where individuals sit in the, the scheme of things. So for me, it's about prevention, it's about rehabilitation, and never, never losing sight of it being about individuals. Um, positive Prison, Positive Future say they value this, but only as part of a comprehensive review and restructuring of the criminal justice system from arrest to a release. Um, and Rod Campbell talked about rejoining the community and, and the thought-provoking approaches we may need to be taken in respect of that. Howard League talks about community-based supervision. That's the future, not more penal. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Jane Baxter. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, obviously, much has already been said of this short bill, and I'll try not to repeat too much, but I think we all agree that ending automatic early release is of itself a good thing. And the committee, accepting uh, Margaret Mitchell, agreed with the general principles. And if we remember, the bill at that stage was dealing with certain categories of long-term prisoners. As amended, it is all long-term prisoners who are serving four years or more. So we all agreed about that, so we weren't talking about short-term prison centres and it's irrelevant in this discussion about this particular bill. Uh, one might say, why not for all? Well, A, it's not the purpose of this bill, and there are practical constraints. We know that in order to deal with that, you have to have more prisoner places, you've got more post-custody support. You also, and the Cabinet Secretary made plain in his evidence to the committee, you have to begin looking at a change of culture to alternatives to custodial short-term sentences, which we know simply do not work and we have a revolving door of people in and out of prison. And partly the announcement now about the way we're going to deal with women offenders, I hope heralds the way to deal with young offenders and others in looking at the whole circumstances that some people, not all, but some people find themselves within the penal system, perhaps through a drug and alcohol habit. 
With the long-term prisoners, one of the things the committee was quite rightly most concerned about was cold release. And therefore, we welcome the stage two extension to all serving four years or more. But we also asked that the six-month period should be part of the custodial sentence. And indeed, that is what it is. So the sentence continues, but there is this bridge, as it were, between having rehabilitation programmes in prison to the period when you're out of prison. And in the evidence that we did have, and nothing's perfect in this world, we were told it was early weeks of a prisoner's release, in fact, the early hours and days, let alone the early weeks, which made the prisoner vulnerable to going back into old habits with old gangs that they knew. I have to say of Elaine Murray's amendment, it's more complicated. We did not take evidence on fractions of sentences and so on. I don't think it takes us anywhere forward. At least with six months, you know where you are. And the six month is the mandatory period. It doesn't mean to say that nothing will continue thereafter. It will also link into, and this is again where you see the larger picture, this must link into the Community Justice Bill. We, the provision in community justice with 100 million going into it is to look at how we handle community sentences and people once released from prison because we know, uh, you know it's, it, that prison doesn't work for most people. There are obviously people that should be kept in prison and away from people because they're a danger to society, but for many it simply doesn't work. Section two, which will be lost if this bill is voted against, is releasing timed to benefit reintegration. Now, we all know, and others have said, to release somebody on Friday is a bad idea. Everything's closed. They're left to meet their old cronies. They've no money. They've no social security. They've no home. They've nothing. So if you vote against this tonight, you're voting against that flexibility which will enable prisoners to be released at an earlier day, up to two days. This gives clarity for victims. Somebody gets sentenced to six years, they do five years, six months, then they have six months with community have supervision. They know where they are with this bill. It isn't perfect. I don't know any perfect legislation that's ever been passed within this parliament. But what the government is endeavouring to do, and it's a start, is to make sure there's continuity of rehab from within the prison to out with the prison and hopefully with the same personnel. And I know that Colin McConnell, uh, Chief Executive of the SPS, has made this plain. This is his aim. I wanted to ask um, about the commencement of this because I note in the bill that the actual substantive part of this legislation commences, if I look at section 3.2, into force in such days as Scottish ministers may by order appoint. Given that if this is passed tonight, we're talking about um, prisoners who will be able to be released at different times, who will have six months. I'd like to have some idea when this might kick into force. And I say to, to Labour, I'm not sure whether you're abstaining or voting against, but I think, frankly, it's a bad move. I think that in doing that, you really if you were successful, you would be stopping people having supervision when they require it. You'd also be stopping people being released at times when they have some chance of having Ms. a Graham, better start. I'm out of Thank time. you very much. Thank you very much. Jane Baxter. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The core principle behind this bill is recognised across the Chamber. Automatic early release of prisoners does not engender confidence amongst the general public in our criminal justice system and must be reformed. That, however, does not mean that this legislation and the Scottish Government's overall approach to, sentences, to sentencing is appropriate or adequate. I think it's important to note again that the Scottish Government attempted to squeeze the content of this important bill into a previous bill, but we should be grateful that they listened to the recommendations of the Justice Committee to place it in a freestanding piece of legislation. Scottish Labour is in complete agreement with victim support groups that there needs to be clarity in sentencing. Victims, the community and offenders need to understand what the sentence passed by the judge or sheriff means in practice. It's not good enough that victims of crime and their families hear that someone is sentenced to X number of years in prison but have no idea what this means in reality. Victims and their families should be at the centre of the criminal justice system and the current system of sentencing fails to put them there. This bill may increase the confusion about sentencing, however, as Victim Support Scotland noted in their submission. Ending automatic early release for only some categories of prisoners would work to further complicate an already confusing system. The proposals would in fact create another rule that needs to be taken into account when calculating the release date of an offender. The amendment put forward by my colleague Elaine Murray was a significant one. 
It recognises that starting this new process with six months to go before the end of a prisoner's sentence is a blunt instrument. Instead, as she has proposed, making it proportional is a much more reasonable approach. It ensures that there is no uniform approach to offenders. It seems bizarre that an offender sentenced to four years' imprisonment would be expected to be placed under supervision for the same length of time as an extremely violent or repeat offender. But that's what the Bill proposes. Scottish Labour's amendment would have given our courts the power to set the period of supervision rather than treat every offender in the same way. A more nuanced approach like this would have helped to ensure that offenders are given a less generic rehabilitation programme, thus minimising the risk of recidivism. It would also have allowed a more joined-up and flexible approach to individual offenders to be introduced. The provisions in Section 2 of the Bill to allow prisoners due to be released on Fridays to be released two days earlier in order to increase the provision of support for them is a good one. It may appear to some to be a relatively minor change, but according to the Scottish Prison Service, around 4,000 prisoners are released every year on Fridays. They emerge into our communities at the weekends with limited support and straight into the weekend, where we know that many people are at an increased risk of breaking the law. We currently do not do enough to help offenders back into the community once they have served their time, and this modest proposal will at least make some provision to increase the support and guidance that they receive. But we must look more closely at the proposals. At the heart of any structure surrounding the release of prisoners must be the calculation of risk to public safety. This is, of course, notoriously difficult to calculate, and it would be wholly unreasonable for us to expect the relevant authorities to successfully calculate the risk of reoffending every time they're called up to do so. But we must ensure that each offender's risk profile no thank you, that each offender's risk profile is central to the debate as to whether they are released early or not. For those who commit serious offences, it should not be an automatic process. I agree with Victim Support Scotland and Police Scotland, who have indicated that they support the essence of the proposals as they will encourage relevant prisoners to engage with prison rehabilitation programmes in order to improve their chances of early release and ensure that those prisoners assessed as still posing a high risk do not benefit from early release. I also agree with the Howard League and other experts who noted that an unintended consequence of the bill would be that prisoners are released cold into the community without a period of supervision from relevant authorities. The amendment put forward by Liam Murray was eminently sensible. I believe that the Parliament would have been wise to accept it and ensure that offenders are dealt with in a way that is more specific to their offending profile. It would have allowed a more subtle approach to be adopted in Scotland to offending. This is a tremendous opportunity for positive change that I regret we have let pass us by today. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to closing speeches and I call on Margaret Mitchell. Four minutes, please. Oh, it's me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I heard followed by. <laughs> uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, if the decision to pass this bill is taken at 4.30 this afternoon, it is one that this Parliament can take absolutely no pride in whatsoever. It's a decision which follows on the heels of the corroboration debacle, a mess the current uh, Cabinet Secretary has been credited with sorting out. Yet here we are again with legitimate concerns and criticisms of key stakeholders who have a wealth of knowledge and experience in the criminal justice system and in the treatment of prisoners being unceremoniously swept aside. The bill does not end automatic early release. Furthermore, the bill's stated aims were to reduce reoffending and improve public sa safety. It does neither. Furthermore, the Bill's proposals are undermined by evidence and knowledge of practice, both of which the Government has chosen to ignore. So a deeply flawed Bill to begin with has been made worse by the lack of scrutiny and the failure to allow sufficient time to consider the major amendments at Stage 2. To put the unacceptable lack of proper scrutiny in context, the Law Society points out that the current law was enacted following two reports, the Scottish one under the chairmanship of Lord Ken Craig, a senator of the College of Justice, and it conducted its deliberations over a period of 14 months. During the same period, the Scottish Prison Service published two consultation documents. So the issue of prison reform was thus the subject of full debate. How ironic that devolution should lead to a weakening of the scrutiny, transparency and accountability of government in Scotland. 
Furthermore, the elephant in the room is the Bill's failure to consider short-term sentences as it is these prisoners who have the highest rates of reoffending. And according to the Scottish Government's own 2013-14 figures, 602 individuals received custodial sentences for attempted murder and serious assault. Of these, a staggering 82% were given sentences of less than four years. Yet these offenders will be released automatically halfway through their sentences. The Bill does not provide the clarity and honesty in sentences which victims and their families want and have the right to expect. The Scottish Conservatives have long called for automatic early release to be abolished for all prisoners, regardless of their crime or the length of their sentence. Based on the evidence we heard at stage one and again at stage two, it is impossible in good faith to allow this bill to continue its parliamentary progress. My amendment would have provided the opportunity to look at the criminal justice system in the round, including short-term sentencing, early release and the associated recidivism rates, and to further scrutinise the other key issues that emerged in evidence and to ensure that these are properly debated and scrutinised. The fact that this was rejected marks a low point in this Parliament's scrutiny process, which is already attracting widespread and justifiable criticism. And it's for these reasons, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives will not be supporting the Bill this evening. Many thanks. I now call on Hugh Henry. Six minutes, please, Mr Henry. Thank you, President Officer. I can't find any fault in the idea that we should end automatic early release. I do think that victims and indeed the general public actually deserve some clarity from our legal system. They expect that when they hear a sentence handed down of a specific length of time, they think that that offender is actually going to serve uh, that length of imprisonment. And it causes real trauma, anxiety and anguish when victims find that those responsible for the crime are out wandering the streets back in their community after a relatively short period. So the idea of stopping the automatic early release is the right one. The problem is but how we go about it. Now, in a sense, I think we deserve to praise the Cabinet Secretary because, as Margaret Mitchell has alluded to, there have been a number of things that he has tackled since taking office where he has changed direction completely from that set out by his predecessor. And frankly, this is another mess that he inherited from his predecessor, and he has worked hard to try to make improvements. But frankly, I don't think that he has managed to sort out the inconsistencies and inadequacies in this bill. We have got things back to front. If we are going to look at such a fundamental change to the way that our legal system operates, then what we should have done is not take this manifesto from the SNP and put it into effect. We should have taken the commitment to establish a sentencing council, which was in the SNP manifesto, and allowed that sentencing council to have an informed view and analysis and come up with some recommendations that this parliament could debate and consider. So we've got it back to front. We've done it the wrong way about, no thank you. We've done it the wrong way about, and that's a shame. Now, Roderick Campbell, in his remarks, and he, he, he criticised Elaine Murray um, said that there was no evidence for the amendment that she was putting forward and indeed that was echoed by Christine Graham. She said that Elaine Murray's amendment, the committee didn't take evidence. 
But in fact, if we look at the comments from the Law Society, when it comes to the government's amendments that were taken at stage two, amendments which have brought in one of the most fundamental changes um, to sentencing that we have seen, the Law Society said, we are concerned that such a sweeping amendment was agreed without any collation of supporting evidence or research. And in our view, full opportunity was not given for proper scrutiny of the amended section one in any significant detail. And indeed others went on to express concerns about the lack of evidence and support for the need to end automatic release for all long-term prisoners. You know, that's a, that's a separate debate. But we cannot criticise Elaine Murray for not providing evidence for her amendment and yet say that we are happy to take this fundamental change from the Scottish Government without evidence, without consultation and without adequate discussion. So again, we have got this wrong. Now, it's imperative, as I said at the beginning, presiding officer, that we have clarity. And as Elaine Murray and others have said, we believe that a prison sentence should mean what it says and that a prisoner should be in prison for at least as long as a judge orders. And that's the point that Elaine Murray has been trying to make, because we believe that we should give our judges the ability to determine the sentence, but also the ability to determine the required supervision, which that prisoner will have to undergo uh, at the end of that sentence. Because I think we all accept that reintegration into society after a long period in prison is not straightforward. But again, if we listen to the Law Society, and they make a valid point, that in the absence of supervision, we are concerned that offenders may leave prison after many years in secure conditions with no or at best minimal opportunity to access properly funded support within the community. And that's one of the problems of what the government is putting forward, because we don't see any structured indication of what supervision and support will be provided. So this, frankly, is a missed opportunity. And it's a shame because I think the public expects us to do something and to do something effective. The government got it wrong. They went about this the wrong way. And we should have taken as a parliament the opportunity to do things properly because that's what victims and that's what the public deserve. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Michael Matheson to wind up. Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary, sorry, eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I've obviously uh, listened with interest to the issues and points raised uh, by members. I must confess some of them were echoes of some of the issues and concerns that were raised at stage uh, one. Uh, when I also, and during the course of that debate, I outlined uh, that I was uh, considering a number of the issues that had been raised during the course of the stage one uh, debate and the evidence taking uh, that had been undertaken by the committee as well. I must confess, though, um, during the course of this debate this afternoon, I've become a wee bit more confused, actually, about the position of some of the parties in this particular debate. Um, I was interested earlier on, and it was repeated again by Margaret Mitchell, that she um, quoted a list of organisations who oppose the bill as it stands at the present moment. It would be fair to say quite a number of whom opposed the bill right at the very outset in the ending of automatic early release organisations that don't believe that we should actually end automatic early release, some of them who think it actually should be, rather than it being six months, it should be 25% of their sentence, should be the period that they should have for community supervision, uh, and uh, would you call, which was a point which was made by Elaine Murray in the stage two uh, uh, consideration within her committee. And I find it's interesting that, as a member, you have chosen to uh, use as your argument a list of organisations who actually to some extent, some of them oppose the idea behind this bill in itself. Whereas my understanding from the Conservative Party's point of view is that you wish to end all automatic early release for all long-term prisoners and for all short-term prisoners, and that you don't support the idea 
that there should be any form of mandatory co community supervision, that you accept that code release should take place. Now, I find it a bit bizarre that we're in a situation that we have members in this chamber quoting organisations in opposing this bill who are actually coming at it from a position where they're actually completely diametrically opposed to what those organisations want. No doubt Margaret Mitchell wants to give some clarification on the matter. Margaret Mitchell. Yes, it's completely true that we do want to uh, end all automatic error release. The difference between the Minister's position and our position is we want to debate the full issue properly to make sure the issue of cold release is looked at, that the rehabilitation is carried out in the most way properly and to facilitate the widest uh, debate and scrutiny to get it right. He's not prepared to do that. Cabinet Secretary. Okay, well, that's maybe the member's view, but the, now it's very clear is that um, the member, the Conservative Party position is that there should be cold release, irrespective as to the implications of that. And despite the fact that the evidence to the committee they said the issue about cold release is the public safety issue. And then the member actually comes to this chamber and says that this bill will actually undermine uh, public safety. I know that the Conservative Party are in a very confused position on this particular bill, but I can't help but feel what I've heard this afternoon has confused the Conservative Party's position even further, because the member also made the point, and Elaine Money made the point incorrectly, that this bill does not end any form of automatic early release. For those prisoners who get an extended sentence, yes, it does. There will be no six-month mandatory period for them because they will have to serve their whole custodial period and their community supervision provision will be through the extended sentence element of it. So it's factually wrong to make that point. But we also seem to be in a position that the, the Conservative Party's position, having introduced automatic early release, are now intending to vote against it or at least abstain against actually the abolition of automatic early release being ended for those prisoners who get an extended sentence. And who are those prisoners that get an extended sentence? The ones that the courts think are the greatest risk to the public. So it makes absolutely no sense that for some reason the Conservative Party would come here and then set out, we're going to vote against it. We're also in a bizarre situation that we seem to have what I think is a bit of a confused position on the Labour Party's benches as well. And that is, if I got it right in listening to Graham Pearson, he also doesn't feel the bill goes far enough. He feels we have to deal with short-term prisoners as well as dealing with those long-term prisoners as well. And also that there should be clarity around what victims should expect as well. Well, the problem with the amendment that was brought forward today by the Labour Party is it would create more confusion. Because at that particular point, the court can say it could be up to 12.5%, but we don't know. We'll wait to see what happens later on. The victim leaves the court not aware of what the position would be. Let me just finish the point and I'll let the member in. We're not aware. What we will get with this bill is that it will be six months. If it's any further than that, it will be the parole board that will make that decision. And as I also outlined, the statistics say very clearly those who get parole release are less likely, significantly less likely, to breach their parole conditions and less likely to be recalled to prison, significantly less than those who get automatic early release. So I think we're now in a position where I think the Labour Party maybe want to end automatic early release for all prisoners, but they want to allow the supervised period to be longer and at the same time create greater confusion for victims on exactly what that means when the sentence is handed down from the court. I'll give way to the Mayor member Pearson. now. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will remember that I did quote the academics who indicated that the approach being suggested in the legislation is confusing and does not improve the situation. So by trying to indicate there is confusion in opposition benches is merely distracting attention from the key issue at the heart of this legislation. It does not deliver for the general public on all the prisoners who go to our court. Uh, to our Cabinet court. Secretary. I does not think the Labour Party's position is confused. Let me just give you an illustration of it. We heard Hugh Henry. He was saying in his contribution that the sentence handed down by the judge should be the sentence that the person has to serve in prison so that victims have got clarity in that. Well, where does that leave parole? 
His parole to be ended altogether? Is there no provision for parole? And does that mean that the Labour Party's position is that there should be no community supervision period if the sentence handed down by the court is the time they have to spend in prison? There is a real confusion at the heart of what the Labour Party think in this matter as well. I know that is a problem they have got in a number of policy issues, and I know that is a problem that they will have to face in the coming weeks and months. But what we can be very clear with this bill, let me finish this point, with this bill is that there will only be a mandatory supervision period of six months unless the person gets supervision under the parole board at an earlier stage after halfway through their sentence. That is very clear and certainly much more clearer than the position that has been put forward by the Labour Party today in this matter. I will give way to Elaine I'm Murray. Sorry, Ms. Ms. Murray. I am sorry, the Minister is in his last 30 seconds. Senator Officer, can I just draw my remarks to a close, again by thanking all of those who have participated in the consideration of this particular piece of legislation, which I believe will add to the public safety and clarity that is necessary around sentencing in bringing automatic early release to an end. This is a good bill that will improve the way in which sentencing is handed down in Scotland. And I would call on all those members who believe that that is what we should achieve here tonight to support this bill when it comes to the vote. That concludes the debate on the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 13584 in the name of Bruce Crawford on the Memorandum of Understanding on the BBC. Can I call on Bruce Crawford to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Devolution Further Powers Committee? Mr Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I may, if I would like to make a few brief remarks by way of an introduction before moving the motion my name on the Committee's behalf. The motion invites Parliament to agree a memorandum of understanding with the BBC and both governments. The MOU sets out what this Parliament can expect in the future by way of a relationship with the BBC, such as agreeing to provide copies of annual reports and agreeing to appear before committees when invited. This will obviously be important, as one issue that we will now begin engagement on is the renewal of the BBC's Royal Charter. I am pleased to say that both governments reached accommodation on the proposed form of words for the MOU. The Devolution Further Powers Committee are therefore able to recommend this MOU to Parliament today, having consulted also with the Education and Culture Committee and the Public Audit Committee. In doing so, let me reiterate today, it is only about the MOU and not about any wider statement by any committee or this Parliament on broadcasting policy per se the independence of the BBC or any question of where devolved competence should lie. I move the motion in my name on behalf of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. Thank you, Mr Crawford. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we have now arrived. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is at motion number 13597, in the name of Michael Matheson, on the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 13597 in the name of Michael Matheson is as follows. Yes, 67. No, 0. There were 46 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to and the prisoners' control of release Scotland Bill is passed. The next question is at motion number 13584, in the name of Bruce Crawford, on the Memorandum of Understanding on the BBC be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We will now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.